Well, the kids is a little bit different. 18 and under, like psychic missions, they'll all go down. That happens not only for Christmas, but like thanks any any major holiday. Fourth of July, if there's something going on, the census cops will go down this way. Welcome back, everybody, to the Badass Motherfucker Podcast. Today, our guest, we have Nikki Taylor, nurse of 16 years and currently a pediatric psych charge nurse. We've heard so many great things about you from your two coworkers, uh, Emily and Peyton. Any interesting things happened in the pediatric psych units recently? Well, it's always something different every time you go to work. That's why I like psych because it's not the same thing every day. So let's see. The latest thing that's happened it probably would be like the, the kids there can be so extra. And, you know, it's always at bedtime. And so by me working, I work 7, 7P to 7A. You so are, uh, you are, everything you are the graveyard. happens. I do. And I like it. Um, and you get to spend a lot more time, I think, with the kids because like during the day, they're doing school, they're doing groups, they're doing other stuff like that. So at night, that's when the true personalities, I feel, come out. So it's always at bedtime. So it's always something, this hurts, that hurts. Most of the time, it's like the younger kids, they see shadows or whatever. So it's always someone knocking at the nurse's station. And, you know, you kind of look around and it's like, <laughs> it's time to go to bed. <laughs> why Why is it? Why so, do you think that is? Well, that they, uh, that they act a little bit more like that at night? It's just because they have nothing else to do? Well, sometimes. And then, it's a, of course, it's hard to get them to go to bed as well. It's always... My stomach hurts. This hurts. Uh, he's looking at me. They're looking at me. So it's always something along that lines and those natures at bedtime. Um, mm -hmm. Just like I guess would be if some a smaller child is at home, they would. Uh, I need a drink, drink of water. My stomach hurts. So it's always something going on like that at night. How how old are these uh, kids that you're working with? So it's different levels. So I work on one level that age range for that with getting ready to start trying to bring in six year olds, but they're going to do a little bit more training on that before we start with the six year olds. So my age group right now is eight to 13, eight to 13, eight to oh, 13. Okay. And then the higher floor is the, the older teenagers. So eight to 13, you mentioned that um, they're going to school during the day. Are, are there like teachers there during the day? Is that what's yeah, happening? There's, there's teachers during the day. So they usually get up, they get them up early, like about seven, and then they go to an affirmation type group where they set their goals for the day. And then they, at the end of the night, we do the end group to wrap it up to see, did you meet your goals for the day? If you didn't, how do you feel? Um, what is your mental status right now? They usually go for the younger kids with faces. So like the smiley face, the, you know, the sad face, the crying face. And so they kind of pick one out and then we try to talk about why are you feeling like that through the day? What happened? So there's an actual, uh, a pretty strict strict schedule during the day. There's like a whole curriculum, things for them to do. Because the thing is, I was I was just recently talking to somebody who worked in the adult psych unit. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. for the most part, I think there's like breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And they're pretty much just kind of roaming around until they take their beds and they're chilling throughout the day. It depends on where you work and what facility you work for. I think with the kids, they want to get them more structure because when you're in school, you're not going to have that time to roam around. So most of the kids are going to be in school from like eight to three or eight to two thirty. So it's not going to be any roaming, roaming around, you know, during that time. So they did just recently started changing the schedule to give them like an hour or an hour and a half in their room to kind of give them a break. Cause who wants to sit in a group all day? I know I wouldn't. And especially that age group. And then, you know, if you're going to younger kids, even the eight year olds don't want to sit there and look at me, talk to them all day. Yeah. <laughs> I see. So what's your day? Like you come in at 7 p.m. What's the day in the life of a charge nurse in the pediatric psych unit who comes in at 7 p.m.? Dinner is usually over. It's at five. So by the time we mm -hmm. get to the floor, it's time to let's do this last group of the day. Let's get your showers in, phone calls to parents. And all that, and all within a seven to nine period, seven to nine time frame. So I have two hours to meet you, see what you had going on all day. Go in there and take a shower. Please take a shower. Because most of the time they've been to the Maybe. gym too, do you know, free time for rec therapy. And it's like, I'm going to need you to take a shower. Okay, can we do that, please? And then all within that is meds. And the whole time I'm walking around, 
I got to go over here, check this, go over here, check this. Cell phone ringing for the charge nurse. Hey, this child over here just fell out on the floor. It's anything within that seven to nine time frame. Two hours, we're running around like chickens with our heads cut off. Yeah. Same thing for the ER, I, I, you know, because I imagine day shift, right? They come in and it's a little <laughs> bit more relaxed. And by the end mm-hmm. of their shift, it's headless chickens running around. Same with like the night shift when they come in, headless yeah. chickens. But by the end of it, you're chilling. So kind of, right, kind, of the right. same, kind of the same cycle in the ER, what is what it sounds like. Yeah, it's basically the same cycle. And then, you know, we get calls, the, you know, kids that are being looked at to be admitted. And then you got to get their room ready. So all of that, and that goes on for the rest of the night too as well. How many uh, patients are you working with as a charge in your unit? So it can hold 24. So usually around holidays, like right about now, it's kind of low. The census is low because, you know, I'm, I'm going to be good for uh, Christmas. Oh, <laughs> is that what is that what happens? Not only for kids, it happens with adults too. You find like they during holidays, the kind of the census kind of goes down, which I'm pretty sure is a lot different in the ER because you guys, you know, be jumping all the time. Doesn't matter. It is a little different in the ER. I think we have what's called seasonal depression. So what, during the holidays, people actually get more lonely, so they do seek more help. Well, the kids is a little bit different. 18 and under, like psych admissions, go all go down. That happens not only for Christmas, but like. Thanks. Any, any major holiday. Fourth of July, if there's something going on, the census counts go down this way. Oh, so you get kind of a little bit of a respite for the holidays. A little bit. <laughs> Just a little bit. So again, your coworkers, Emily and um, Peyton, were telling me that they love having you around, especially mm-hmm. during the night shift when things are a little <laughs> bit more chill because mm-hmm. you have endless amounts of stories. They, they feel like they're sitting around a campfire listening to a storyteller. And I was like, that's amazing. I would love to hear some of these stories. They tell me it's, they're riveting. What's a, what's a story that you'd like to start off with? Let's probably go back. I'm originally from North Carolina. So we're uh-huh. going to go back to a facility that I worked at. And it was an old army barracks way back in the day. So I had heard different stories about uh, how there's been ghosts seen over here, you know, kind of shadows or whatever passing by. So at the, po- at the time and place I was also night shift for this one and we had a child that had chicken pox so of course they had to be separated from everybody else a couple of people hadn't had any chicken pox so this unit you got to keep in mind it's the old army barracks so it's a long hallway and they're sort of like buildings off to the side so and as you walk down the hallway at night the lights behind you cut off click 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 and sort of lights up in front of you so i'm going to this other unit that's like feels like a mile and a half away from where the unit that I was actually on to check on this child that had been separated. And if you go, she was on the second floor. So the steps go this way and then it's a blind spot and you see a wall and then they go this way. So I go in to relieve this young man for, uh, <laughs> for his lunch break for 30 minutes. So the nurse's station is glassed off, you know, it locks when you go in. So, you know, someone can't come in there, a child or whatever. So I'm sitting there, I'm reading a book. The whole unit is locked. There's just me and this young lady that's over there. And I kind of kind of glanced up and I see like, okay, what's this? And it's sort of like a shadow of like a young, this, I never believed in ghosts before. And this young man is, I could see through, no eyes is coming. And we kind of locked whatever I thought was eyes. And he's going past the nurse's station and I'm watching go past the nurse's station like this. And I'm thinking, please let that door be locked. Please let that door be locked. And it's like they walked past me and then the light kind of flickered on in the bathroom that's behind me for the unit. And so this young man comes back from break and I'm, I'm, I already got my stuff. I'm ready. I got my clipboard up under my arm and a stethoscope is around my neck. And as soon as he walked in, I was like, I got to go. <laughs> Went out, unlocked the unit door and closed it and then went to go to the stairway and the door behind me opens and I turn around and look, there's nobody there. I'm telling you, I hit them steps. I don't think I hit not one step going down there. I don't I don't remember running from that unit to back to where I was. And the next night I was like, I'm not going over there. What unit was this? It's actually, it was a psychiatric hospital, but it was an older one, but it used to be like an old army barrack. Oh, those are the scariest. I don't know why they would change those to psych units. I've been to a few of those, these old school buildings that are just super creepy. And then, of course, as I'm running, the lights are delayed because it 
cuts on as you kind of walk through. So the light come on, then the one behind you cuts off. So I'm basically, they're, they're illuminating and coming on as I run past all the other ones. So that Dude. place, and I, I was there, I think, for, it was about two years I was there. You know, you say your little player, please don't let anything be in the car with me. And that, you know, and I was a smoker. So it's another instance where, because I was working there as an agency nurse, so we had to put in our, um, you know, write our time sheets and go take them to the director of nursing's office and put them in there. <laughs> Went past there. Put in, cut the lights on, put it into her uh, her mailbox, cut the lights back off. You know, I was like, okay, you know, I think I want a cigarette, so I'm going to go out this door over here. And I went out the door to the outside, and as I'm standing there smoking a cigarette, the lights that I just left came on, and I could see, like, shadows, like, all behind, like, the blinds. Needless to say, I didn't finish that cigarette. Thick, and then I'm gone. <laughs> I was so glad. And then they finally closed that one down and built like a new facility in a couple of uh, places in uh, North Carolina kind of merged together and became like one big hospital. Did anybody else who worked there, did they also have similar encounters? Yeah, they actually told me when I first came there as an agency nurse that, you know, you see kind of shadows and doors opening and all that kind of stuff. But I was like, I didn't believe it. When I first, you know, when I first started, I was like, they just trying to scare me. I'm the new nurse. I'm going to be here at night. It's going to be limited staying. And I just thought they were trying to scare me. But no, then finally, after a couple of months, I saw it for myself. What the fuck? That's what I said. When, he, when that thing came walking or whatever it was, and it looked like a child, that was my first instance. But do you think it was a child? It looked like a child to me, but, you know, it could have been a teenager. But it looked, yeah. well, I was going to say it looked smaller than me, but I ain't that tall either, so. <laughs> You're thinking maybe it was a patient of the hospital. It wasn't from, like, in, like, like before where they were using it for, like, a base and for, like, the army. I don't think it, no, it didn't look like it. And I don't know if it was, like, someone had been you know, killed on the facility or whatever. But also you got to keep in mind there was a graveyard not too far, you know, behind this place too as well. But you know what? It's amazing that so many places that I've worked for or worked at like psych hospitals or behavioral health hospitals, they're always near a graveyard. And why would you put something like that for somebody that's seeing something and then you put a facility like right beside a graveyard? It's probably cheaper. <laughs> that's why. There you go. Right. <laughs> the lane's cheaper. Nobody else wants cheaper. to live there. <laughs> nobody, nobody wants to be anywhere near that. So we're like, well, we need a hospital. Why don't we use this huge building that nobody wants to be around? And it's so weird. Like I've been to so many buildings too, where like they use it as a hospital or like a psych facility. It always just looks like, dude, this looks like the beast from Beauty and the Beast lives here. Like, what are we doing up here? It's a scary place to go. And I, I would be scared to go in anywhere like that and just look at some of the places and then you get in and then it looks even worse on the inside. How far into your nursing career were you when uh, when something like that happened? I would say probably a good eight, nine years since I worked there. Because I've been in psych primarily for the last 10 years. You know, you leave and take a little break for your mental health. And then, of course, I like psych. That's what I've always wanted to do. 10 years as a psych nurse, that's no joke. Yeah, yeah. And Why? What drew you to this particular profession? <laughs> I can go all the way back to nursing school. Of course, when you're in nursing school, the two that stick out, I don't think anybody goes into nursing school and after that rotation be like, oh yeah, I want to be a med surg nurse. That, that ain't it. So I didn't like that rotation. I didn't like the geriatric rotation. So the two that stuck out, of course, was labor and delivery. And then we hadn't been to the psych rotation yet. So of course, you know, I want to be a labor and delivery nurse. That's exactly what I want to do. I want to play with babies all day. Mm -hmm. Then we hit psych. It was like a whole new world. Because let me tell you, I met Jesus. <laughs> I met Tupac. <laughs> I met a young man that was African-American, but he was white. That's what he identified as. So it was all kinds of stuff. So every time you went, you met somebody new. So you liked the kind of excitement of like what these, what this patient population kind of brought to you. Oh, absolutely. And then I worked uh, like at a facility and then I also transitioned into doing like um, home health site, which I basically was like on my own. You know, we worked for, uh, you know, this outpatient. Uh, I would go to actually their jobs, their homes, wherever they wanted to meet me at and do stuff like that too. So that was nice. So that was like, I made my own schedule. You just have your cell phone and your laptop and you go out there and have your schedule of, you know, your list of patients. It was called an ACT team, which is dual diagnosis. 
So it was mental health issues and also substance abuse issues. I had a young lady that identified or she thought she was a butterfly. So I went to meet with her one day and she came to the car and she was like, I can't talk to you today because, you know, my, one of my antennas is a little crooked today. And I, you know, just reached up and, okay, now it's fixed. Let's go talk. <laughs> now you can, you can hear me. It worked. Did it, we did it got work? It talk. worked. <laughs> yeah, it worked. <laughs> But that, but that's what it is sometimes, you know, sometimes like you're not, you're not encouraging them mm -hmm. to do it. You're just, you're just kind of like, okay, we got to play this game to get you better. Yeah. You know, so yeah, like it happens, yeah. it happens in the ER too. It's like, okay, yes. You think, you know, you're a butterfly. Okay. Well, does, is the butterfly hungry? Does it, do they need a nap? Like what's going on? What, how can we do, what can we do to help you? I know I have one of my, one of the favorite memes that I have that I show everybody on my phone was, uh, Someone coming up and saying, you got to let me out of here. It's like, it's like a psych meme. You got to let me out of here. You got to let me out of here. Or I'm going to do this or I'm going to do that. And then, you know, the nurse looks and said, well, the best thing I can do is give you two graham crackers. <laughs> <laughs> and it probably worked. Like, all right, I'll it take works. It. I'll take the it graham works. crackers. It works. It works. I'll take the graham crackers if that's all you can get. Yeah. But yeah. Wow. But it's all yeah. kinds of stories. Let's see. I have one that's with, working with that same um, team was a young lady that was a lady of the night. Dawn was her job description. Loved her to death. She was as sweet as she could be, but she had no teeth. Mm. So I'm working, I'm working, I'm working. If anybody that knows that works with Medicaid, certain things you can only get certain times of the year. So <laughs> I have worked my butt off to get her teeth. You know, with Medicaid paying for them or whatever, you they, you can only get them every 10 years. I think she had them for about a week when she gives me a panic call saying that she couldn't find her teeth. So what she had did was she had taken them off and left them on the nightstand in a paper towel, left, and the maid that came in to clean up the space threw them away. And so I pulled up to meet with her to have our session and I was like, okay, girl, why is you gumming at me? Where's your teeth? <laughs> and that's what she told me the story of, well, see what had happened. And I was like, okay, well, you know, you're going to be gumming for the next 10 years. Cause that's it. I can't that's help it. you anymore. That's it. That's it. <laughs> that's it. They don't give those out too easily. That's it, girl. They do not. That's it. I'm so sorry. Do you ever feel like, you know, you're, you are in danger or do you usually feel pretty safe when you go and, you know, meet with uh, your patients? I do. I think the first thing you, you've got to do, you got to let, of course, let them know who's in charge. So yeah, I might be small, but I got bite. <laughs> I may be short. So the first thing, you know, well, I don't know. Well, guess what? I'm the charge nurse. And what I say goes, that's the end of the discussion. I'll help you any way that I can. But at the end of the day, it's my word that's going to stand and not yours. So wow. you can't, you definitely can't go in with a timid attitude working in psych. That's for sure. You gotta, uh, you have to have the Napoleon complex. I may be small, but my bite's hard. Yeah. <laughs> and my, I think one of my favorite sayings too is, well, don't let this badge fool you because I'll take this badge off and then I'll work it up. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. Sometimes you do, especially if you, you have somebody that's, uh, Six foot. You don't even have to be six feet to be taller than me. So you kind of got to put that that dominance. I got to be the alpha. So what I say goes, it was, you know, that's just the way. You just got to put it a nice way. But of course, it's always going to be somebody that challenges you all the time. All the time. All the time. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because there was another instance I'm thinking about where we have these cameras that you can ring, like, to come onto the unit um, at this place that I was working. And... <laughs> These young men, just they just kept ringing it and it would come on and I would cut it off because I could see who it was from the camera that you don't want anything. And this was my first time meeting them because I had been off probably, I think it was like a five or six day stretch. So I didn't know them. One was big, one was kind of small, but they both were still bigger than me. And they kept ringing and ringing and I was like, you know what? Hold on. So I matched the thing and I was like, what, what do you want? And they just kind of because they could see me on the screen too as well. And I was like, okay. And then I did what I needed to do. And I went around there and I was like, okay, who is this ringing my damn bell? What the fuck do you want? Really? <laughs> well, you have to. And then after that, after you let, you know, become the alpha or whatever, everybody likes you. As soon yeah. as you walk on the unit, hey, 
So you yeah. have to. As soon as you walk in, you have to. All right. Well, fucking good for you. Yeah. Be the alpha. Yeah. Yeah. Got to be the alpha. Because then you, you have a team that's standing behind you that is expecting you. If I'm in trouble, I need you to help me. And it's the same way for adults and pediatrics. So you get in there, you, you just got to really put your foot down, show them who's in charge. Yeah, you do. But I do find it, the, the kids are grateful too as well, but adults are a little bit more grateful, especially if you have ones that are, you know, completely stable on their meds and that you're going out there to give them an injection or whatever that they're supposed to have. That's mostly what I did along with the sessions. And then every like once a week, I would go out with the actual psychiatrist too as well. I mean, I've worked with psych patients for a long time, 10 years in the ER. Mm -hmm. um, I guess in your opinion, like, what is, how do we make it better for them? You know? A I mean, lot of people, especially, yes, I, was, no, I wouldn't even say especially. Uh, I was going to say especially, the, you know, their kids. But every psych patient that I've ever met in my whole 10 years of being in psych just wants somebody to sit down and listen. Listen to what I'm saying. Listen to what I'm going through. This is what's happening to me. They want somebody to listen and take what they're saying seriously. Yeah, they just want to be taken seriously. That's that's what I think in my whole experience. You know, for some, they they definitely the younger um, people too as well feel like their parents are not talking to them or listening or hearing what I'm saying. I guess yeah, no, that would make sense. And are, are all these your pediatric population? They're coming in. Are how how does it work? Do they call themselves or are the parents like okay, it's time for you to go in? Like how do you, how do these patients get admitted? Yeah, it's different ones. Like different like different places I've worked at. Some places they come in through the emergency room, and then you know you get a referral. Or like some hospitals, like the one I worked in in North Carolina, they actually have like a, an ER for the uh, psych hospital, so you can actually pull up and take your child in and get them be evaluated by a psychiatrist. Um, and then the psychiatrist will recommend whether or not inpatient or outpatient or whatever is needed. Depending on, of course, you know, you have to be a danger to self or others within the past 24, 48 hours. So that's kind of how they, you know, meet their criteria. But then, you know, I've worked with some doctors that's like, you know, well, if, you know, the aggression that comes in, you know, if they are not aggressive outside of the home, then, you know, they can come in and we'll do what we need to do. And I'm thinking to myself, if you beat up your damn mama, what is that going to happen to me? You don't know me. So I don't think that should be a standard for a criteria. For a child to be admitted, if they are not aggressive outside the home, correct. Yeah, that's some. Yes, that's some sort of criteria that they have. If they're aggressive outside the home, then we might have to, you know, try to send them to another facility or try to get them some kind of outpatient treatment. But if the only thing you've done is beat up your mom and daddy, we're gonna come bring you on in here. Then you can beat up the nurse. <laughs> come on in. Jeez. That's what it feels like, anyway. The psych in general is just always a little sad, but to hear like. To have like kids, you know, have these issues. It's it. I don't know why. It just kind of makes it like worse for me. It's just like ugh, like kids should not have to be, to deal with these things. You haven't seen enough. Like what is happening? Right, right. And I think a lot of it too. A lot of kids that we get have issues with bullying in school. And mm. you know, you try to tell them, you know, this is not going to last that long. High school, school, or whatever. It's not. But I want to hear them. right now. This is my life. This is my reality. This is what's happening to me right now. So, and it's kind of hard to be like, you know what? When you get out of high school, some of these people that's bullying you, you're not going to see them no more ever in life. So, but they can, you know, that's me coming from 56. You know, I'm a 50, 56 years old and they don't understand that, you know, after I leave here, I got to go back to the same people that's causing me issues. So you try to tell them, of course, this is not going to last forever. But right now, this is my reality. And then, you know, like I said, they want you to listen. And for some reason, bullying has gotten really bad. I don't know. I don't know why. Why do you got to be so mean to each other? You think it's gotten worse? Yeah. My son, well, my son's 26, but I don't remember him being in school and having issues with bullying as much as going on now. I don't know. I don't know what's going on. Yeah. You've worked with these, this population for so long. I yeah. was bullied in high school too. Like I, I absolutely hated it. I mean, there were days where like, I was like, I would pretend to be sick just not to go to school. Like, so I can't imagine. That's awful. No, nobody should feel like that. That's supposed to be one of your safe spaces. So and for some kids, unfortunately it's not. So what happens if the kids are being bullied and they come home, they're upset. Are they lashing out at their family members? And is that, that's why 
the family members like, hey, I think. No, not necessarily lashing out at their family members. Most of the time, it's the bullying that I've seen and that age population ends up to being that have suicidal ideation or they uh, resort to self-injurious behavior and stuff like that, and cutting and all that. So, mm, yeah. And that's really sad to see. That is. And like, especially what you said, like, you know, you can make them feel better, better in the moment, but like they're, you're, they're going back to the same school unless. To the same school, the same situation. Yeah. Because I mean, I, I'm in acute. So we get yeah. the kids that come in, get them stabilized, see if you have any kind of, you know, depression or other kind of metabolic issues going on, causing any kind of slight issues or whatever. But they only stay with me from like seven to 10 days. So I can't solve or we can't solve everything that's going on. So you have to bring the parents in and, you know, this is what's happening. And then sometimes that falls back to, well, they don't listen to me. They're not listening to what I'm saying. So that's kind of hard too. And then you have kids that come in and they like being in a psychiatric facility. And my first thought is, what is going on at home in the outside world that you prefer to be locked up in here with me than to be out there in the world living your life? Yeah. 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 How bad is that at yeah. home that you'd rather be here? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or who knows? Absolutely. Maybe you just maybe maybe you just provide a very fun environment, Nikki. Maybe I want to be there with you. <laughs> well, we try to anyway. We have different stuff going on. They got the the what's the the playstations and all that stuff. Let's do just dance. Let's do this. Let's go to the you know go to the outside to the gym. Let's go outside. You know, I mean, it's, and you plus also you got to remember we allow them to be a kid too. Do, do, you, do you have you I mean, do you remember any anything like that for, with a kid who's who was so happy to be here that they'd rather not be at home and you kind of found out what was happening at home? We had a young lady at a facility that I worked with that was like a cutter. And she would come in like frequently and, you know, come in and do. The, Can I ask how old she is? She was 14. She, she was, was 14. 14. And this was yeah, this was in North Carolina. And just I mean, just cut cutting and you know had didn't really want to commit suicide but was using cutting as a form of self-pain so i know they we had a treatment team and you know that also includes like the psychiatrist the nurse the charge nurse and includes their parents and family well i knew the girl's history had been molested from the age of six until 12 by her older brother and oh, he God. went to jail for, yeah, he went to jail for that. And then she was doing good. We hadn't seen her for like a couple of years. And then she ended up coming back and found out when she came back that last time was because the parents let the older brother move back into the same house where she was. What the, f- what the, f- yeah, yeah, what the fuck? <laughs> yeah. And it's like, and they couldn't understand why she had been doing so good. For so long, then all of a sudden, now she went back to cutting. So doing a little oh bit my. more deep, yeah, deep that is doing so, a little that is bit. <laughs> so upsetting. And Are it's you like fucking kidding me. And then that was found out, like like doing the treatment team, you know. And it's like and all of us sitting there looking like you can't understand or figure out why she has started back cutting after you know being a couple of years doing so well. What ended up happening? Did he had nowhere to go? Oh my god! Please. So any you know, other therapists and stuff get involved and, you know, make CPS reports and all that kind of stuff. So end result was they had to, he had to go, he had to move. If you want her to come back and stay with you. And then you also have to keep in mind, he was not a minor. He was over 18 by this time. I think he went to stay with a, a grandparent or a family member or something like that after, you know, the report and stuff was taken for given to CPS. That's so sad. I mean, I, initially, I was angry at the parents. I still am, but I'm just like, what, in in what world? What's going through your you head? You still that, can like, be angry at them because I was. <laughs> oh my! Like, I'm angry, but I'm like so sa- so sad for the situation. Like, how, like I don't know. I mean, wanted to ask you these patients and these kids who are cutting themselves. Like, why do you think they do it? Like, what is the feeling they get that that drives them to do something like that to themselves? Most of what I hear of the kids that do self injurious behavior is. The mental pain is so great that cutting takes my mind off of the actual mental pain and the physical pain makes me feel better. Every Whoa. last person that I've ever talked to says that that's what it is. 
because I can't control sometimes my mental pain, but I can control this physical pain. And it takes my mind off my mental anguish when I cut. It makes me feel better. That's so sad. When kids have psych issues, man, like I just, I just, I know, I know adults have like stuff going on, like parents. Right, right, right. It's not easy to be a parent, right? But then you, but then you mm-hmm. think like, you know, and then you hear stuff like that. I'm just like, come on, man, just please just get it together. Like, like the child doesn't deserve this. Like, right, right, right. Oh, God. Yeah, it can be hard. It can be heartbreaking sometimes, too, as well, because you wish you could, like, flip a magic switch and everything is better and everything is okay. And then, of course, you know, that with them being under 18, there's not a lot of psych drugs that you can give them to make them feel better because they aren't actually an adult yet. Why is it that we we can't give the adult drugs to the, the pediatric patients? <sighs> For that very same reason, they have a big completely finished developing um, under the age of 18. So you don't know as long with their hormones and all that kind of stuff that's going on. You don't know whether or not this medication is going to make them better or worse. I don't think they do enough research. I don't think in what parent, I guess, want to give their under 18 child, you know, a drug, a research drug for psychiatric Mm -hmm. issues. Mm-hmm. So there's not a lot of, st- I don't think, studies on how these psych drugs would affect someone under the age 18. I mean, how do you deal with it? Like like you said, it's it's heartbreaking. Me listening in is heartbreaking. Mm-hmm. I imagine there's so many more stories like that. Like, how do you, do you ever burn out? Like, well, you said you used to yeah. take breaks, you, you would take breaks, to, you know. The most I can do um, at a time is like three or four years um, doing like straight psych. Like in between, I've done medical home health. I've done um, medical home health, I think, was the longest. That's the one I usually go back to. And that's just dealing with straight. I need a wound vac put on, you know, stuff like that and go into people's homes and, you know, evaluate them to see if they qualify for home health services. So I take a break. I'll do three years and then I'll take a break and go do something else that doesn't have anything to do with psych. And it helps, too, as well, like working 12 hours because you get those days, if you schedule it just right, you can get a whole full seven days in between the next time you have to go back to work. Yeah. And you know what? Sometimes yeah. even that doesn't feel like enough. <laughs> it does. Sometimes it does. <laughs> I'm supposed to go back to work tomorrow, but I'm thinking, hmm, no, I'm going. I'm going. <laughs> I'm going. I've been off for about five days, so I'm going. <laughs> oh, okay. So, so you're in a good spot right now. You're happy. I'm in a good spot right now. I am. Yeah. But, you know, it's so many different stories and so many funny stories, you know, with psych. It's, it's, it's something every day, something different every day. I think that's why I like it and end up going dark to it even after taking a break. Was there a story that you can remember that kind of just like, okay, I should probably just take that break immediately right now? Did a story ever just like completely floor you where you were just like, you know what? I can't do this. I need, I need the day off tomorrow. I'm calling in. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I know we've like uh, we've had a had a child that came in and it was like every day, every day it was five to six physical holes, pulling out injections and giving, 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 and it's like by the time that child left, he had two charts working on the third, and it's like you know what? I need a mental health day, and it's just for no reason, just like violence hitting other kids, trying to hurt themselves, trying to hurt staff. And, you know, that's the main thing that they don't want to happen when you're working in a psychiatric facility with anybody, whether it be adults or kids. They don't want the patient to get hurt. They don't want staff to get hurt. So they take you through all this training on how to put someone in a therapeutic hold. This one child that we had every day, they would first shift from 7A to 7P. They didn't had six or seven holes during the day. Then they come in at night and we have from seven, don't want to go to bed to like one or two o'clock in the morning. And then we have seven holes. That's 14 holes in a day. So it got to a point the staff was like, we all finna call out. When you say holes, like six holes in a shift, what does that actually mean? A, phys- a, a physical hole. That means I had to get on the walk in, say code, whatever, and use those different codes, the colors, you know, for different codes. That means one either means that I have a child that's acting up. I need all available staff, um, the certain color, or I, we already have a child or an adult in a physical hole by staff. 
and I still need everybody, all available people in the building to come to my floor. So you're actually physically either holding them behind them or have them down on the floor with like one person on each arm, someone on the legs, someone on the waist, and we're holding until the nurse can either, you know, call the doctor. They require, they give you some medication, either by an IM injection or if the patient, you think it's, you know, it's the nurse's judgment, is calm enough to take something by mouth. Do you guys ever put uh, these patients in restraints? Some facilities are restraint free, mm. but they'll put you in a physical hole. Some facilities, they do have um, restraints that you can put them either in a chair or a bed. But there are some places where you can all, you're only allowed to physically hold these patients down with mm-hmm. staff members. Because they're restraint, they're strength, restraint free facilities. They're restraint free. And that's just hopefully to not traumatize the patient while they're there. Right. And it's kind of hard. I think that actually a physical hold is more helpful than putting someone, you know, restraining them to a chair, restraining them to the bed. Because restraining you to a chair or a bed, you know, staff can, you know, back away and leave you there. But if I'm physically holding you, I can talk to you, tell you to calm down, take a couple of deep breaths, just calm down, we're here for you. And it's like the human touch too as well. Mm -hmm. Because the only thing I'm doing is keeping you from hurting yourself. And and you're saying there was one patient who you had to do this about six to seven times a shift. 14 times in a day. So like six or seven on first shift, six or seven on night shift. And just like I told him that day after like the last one, he finally, the medication kicked in and he finally went to bed. I was like, I ain't coming tomorrow. It ended up being after they heard me, I guess as a charge or say, I can't do this no more. I need a break. That I bench when I finally came back, I found out that everybody else had called in. So it was the CEO, which was the nurse. She was a nurse, the director of nursing, and then a nursing supervisor ran the unit. Man, when I tell you I came back, that shit was tore up. There was no, <laughs> there was no complete orders. The admissions they had done, the paperwork hadn't been filled out. It was like, what the hell? I ain't calling out no more because if this is what I got to come back to <laughs> and get everything straight, I'm not doing it more. Oh, my God. Yeah. Wow. One kid just wiped out the entire unit. Wiped out the entire unit. Yep. Oh, and it geez. can happen. Yeah. It can happen. It doesn't matter how big or small they are. It's just the simple fact that you're they're probably exhausted. We're exhausted. You have to have a mental health day if you want your staff to keep on trucking. Yeah. And and for, for patients like this, where are the parents around? Are they there? Is it is it different for everybody? A patient like who's like that it's, difficult? You know, they also can have kids that can stay past the 10 days. So this young man, uh, this patient actually stayed past the 10 days. So getting more into like therapy and getting him to open up and what we found was giving him consistent staff. So giving him the same mental health coaches to work with every day, trying to work, get him to work with the same nurses every Mm. day and definitely making sure he had the same therapist to talk to. So come find out he was treated like the man of the house at nine years old. And he had younger siblings that was like all the way it, it total. It was like six of them all the way down to like, uh, like a newborn. So he was like treated like the man of the house. He was cutting the grass. He was like protecting mama. Mama was getting him to help take care of the younger five kids. So he wasn't able to be a child. So that kind of like presented itself in aggression. So once we figured that out, like, and it took a while to get him to open up, to find out, you know, the different things that was going on. After that, if he realized that here you can be a child, we don't need anything from you, then the hole started coming down. I think he was with us for like almost two months. The day I went to discharge him, he wrapped himself around my legs and did not want to leave. Yeah, yeah. So that's one that would make me cry. It's like, you don't want to put somebody in a hole to make them go out of the building. So it took a while and I had to, you know, sit down and talk to him and say, hey, Mom has had some therapy sessions too. She knows that you're a kid. Things are going to change. You got to give her an opportunity. You got to give her a chance. And so far, as far as I know, he's doing well. Hadn't been back. I guess that's what it is. Like you just got to let these kids be kids, but and then try to try to avoid the bullies. 
Yeah, he became, let me see. First, when he first started, after he started calming down, he started, he, had, he was going to be a coach, one of the people that worked in mental health. Then he was very creative, um, helped us clean up the unit <laughs> when there was like codes. He knew all the, 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 the colors for the codes. He wanted to come and help staff with the codes. <laughs> he had made like, he was an FBI agent, had like the, um, someone had gave him, given him uh, 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 boxes and he had cut into like a bulletproof vest had FBI reading up there, <laughs> had a badge. And so he was going to run the whole unit. He was going to be the, our security. So, oh my God. You know, he became, every, he, and it's like a whole turnaround. So he became like everybody's favorite after that rough start. Yeah. You build a little trust, you know, mm -hmm. you give him a chance yeah. to be himself, give him a chance to thrive. That's oh. so nice. <laughs> yeah. Give him a chance to be a kid. <laughs> I yeah. don't know why they don't want to, they, they want to, and the teenagers of course want to grow up so fast. I hate, I, I, they, I have my mom have rules and, and I can't do this and I can't do that. And I'd be like, you know what? Well, adults got damn rules too. They just call them laws and we go to jail if we break those rules. Right. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, stake, the stakes are a little higher. A whole lot higher. It sounds like, you know, these kids who are, who are having trouble, there's always, there seems like to be, there seems like there's a lot of like disconnect with them and their parents. Um, yeah. How do you deal with parents? Do you ever like, I know you kind of know like, hey, you probably shouldn't be bringing the older brother who molested your daughter home. You know, you know that. But how do you, how do you right. like tell them that without them? Because I would imagine they'd get offended if you kind of was like, right. this is kind of what you need to do for your child if you want them to feel better. Like, it's almost like I've, I've had moments in the ER where it's like, don't tell me how to you know, live my life. Don't tell me how to raise my children. So have, mm -hmm. have you ever encountered mm -hmm. something like that? And like, how, how do you go about dealing with that stuff well if you kind of turn it around on them like with the young lady that i was talking about before with the older brother like you know doing treatment team and after she was adamant so you know the nurses kind of sat down with her and was like just let me just let me put it to you this way i know he's your son she's your daughter you love both of them he came out he had nowhere to go but think about you mom if i you know, you had been sexually assaulted and I bring you here and then I put the man that sexually assaulted you for you guys to live together under the same roof. How would you feel? Would you feel hopeless and helpless? And, you know, and they and they listen parents because most of the time parents, of course, they want you run to some parents that don't care. But most of the parents that you run into actually really I want my child to be better. I want them to have help. You have to give the parents some education too, as well on mental health issues because some of them sometimes don't understand. I guess yeah, you're right. Like I'm sure they want to help, but you now sometimes they mm -hmm. just don't know how to. You know, and that sometimes as parents or as adults, you'd be like, okay, your child, I feed you, I clothe you, you have somewhere to stay, you have no thing to worry about, and so for clean your room and you know follow the rules of my house. What's so bad? You know, some people have that mentality and it'd be like, well, other things, other things in the environment. It's going on with me too as well. Go back to school, the bullying. It can be a whole host of things. I feel like when I'm talking to you, you're not listening to me. So it's a whole lot of things that can factor in that. You have to do education with the parent too as well to help them understand why, you know, why my child is feeling like this or acting like this. Yeah, you know, I, th I feel like I've had that issue with my parents when I was younger too. And for them, like I'm, I'm Vietnamese. My parents immigrated here, you know, escaped mm -hmm. in a communist country four nights and three days on a boat to get to Thailand, six months at a refugee camp, finally get to America. So when I tell them, hey, like, I'm not, this is a bully. They're like, listen, we risked our entire life to be here for you, you know? Shut it up. up. Uh, Shut up and go back to school, right? <laughs> like, it up, yeah. I don't, I don't want to hear yeah. about your petty little problems when I almost drowned at 17 in the middle of like the freaking ocean. We as adults do do that sometimes the kids, but you got to take a step back and realize, okay, yeah, that's what you went through. Now I got to listen to what my child is going through. Appreciate you so much for sharing your stories. I'd like to end the conversation with two uh, last questions. One being, you okay. know, for you, 16 year nurse, a lot of experience. What is the most important lesson you have learned over your illustrious nursing career being able to listen and it's it's real hard for me to as well as a nurse especially a psych nurse 
it's hard to not project things or kind of correlate things that you've been through when you're talking to someone. So learning how to just shut up, listen, process what that person is saying to you and try not to turn it around on, well, this is what I did and this is what happened to me. It's real hard in sight not to try to turn around and then be like, well, this is what happened to me when you're talking to someone that's trying to tell you what's going on in their life. So that's one of the most important things and most the hardest lesson I've ever had to learn as a sight nurse is try not to correlate what someone is telling me they're going through and try to equate it with my experience of what I've went through. Yeah, because it goes back to what you said, right? Like by you trying to like relate to them, you're trying to say that Mm -hmm. it's going to get better. And that's right. not really what they right. want to hear right now, you know? It's not what they want to hear. Because I can't guarantee you it's going to get better. And that's a hard thing not to do, too, as well. Give guarantees. Thank you for that. And the last question is, um, I have a series online called Tips from the ER, where I give uh, tips here and there about coming to the ER. So I wanted to ask you, tips from the pediatric psych unit. What is one thing uh, you want people to know or, or understand about your job? Definite empathy um, with your patients and that you're talking to. If you don't have empathy, then what are you here for? Especially in the psych field. And I'm pretty sure in the medical field too as well. You got to empathize with the patients that you're caring for. And you can't have that illustrious, I'm up here, I'm the nurse. You got to do what I say. If a parent was looking to bring their child in or they were worried or, you know, a child was worried and was like, seeking help what's one thing like what, what what should they know about like the process of coming in and like you know being in the psych unit that a lot of the therapy um the medications that the doctor's looking for the parents is going to be into that part of the treatment team as well every place that i've ever worked the parent is the number one then it's the psychiatrist and then it's the nurses and then it's the therapist so the parent is absolutely got to be involved we're going to before anything is done with your child, the doctor and the nurses are going to talk to you. The doctor is going to talk to you about why I think this certain medication or this kind of therapy is going to be good for your child. The nurse, call us at any time. We'll give you an update on what your child has been doing through the day and through you know the last 24 hours. Always feel free to give us a call because we'll always be there to talk to you from the start to the finish. And that we're not going to leave you hanging with a person when your child is discharged. There's going to be a plan in place. We give coping skills. We give a treatment plan. If your child needs outpatient therapy, that's put in place. Everything is done for you before you leave. So you're not going to be left hanging at all. Anybody's got, you know, any hesitation or doesn't know what's going on, that's it. And if you're lucky enough, Nikki will be in charge of the unit that you're on. So <laughs> Nikki, thank you so much for uh, enlightening us with your stories. No problem. And your wonderful career. That was wonderful. Do you have any questions for me before uh, we end the end the little call? No, no questions. But I must say, I have seen your uh, video about the different people pronouncing their medications when they come into the ER. I have it actually saved on my phone. <laughs> yes. You know, you know, what's so funny? I, my last show, um, somebody, I forgot what she did, but I think she was, she was a teacher of some sort, but that was like, mm-hmm. anytime she get like, she had a new class, th- those are the first videos she would show her class as an icebreaker. They would play the mispronounced medication and she would ask the class, what do you think it is? So mm-hmm. it's so yeah. great to, yeah, those videos are pretty popular. It's so great to hear that. Um, I love that one. Like I said, I have that one saved on my phone. When I want a good laugh, I always pull that one out. And I showed it to my son. He thought it was hilarious. That's awesome. He's like, do people actually do that? I was like, uh, yeah. Hell yeah. <laughs> you they try, absolutely do. You try to pronounce those words if you've never seen it. It's, they're ridiculous. I'm telling you. Look, it's some of them, they're hard for the nurses to pronounce because it took me a long time. Like high thoracides, I, I, I still get tongue-tied. I'm telling that you. that medication. I'm it's like you. they're 15 letters long. They make it They make it hard on purpose. <laughs> they make it hard so they can feel good about themselves. I don't know who's naming these things. Just call it, just give it one syllable, asshole. That's it. That's all I need. <laughs> That's it. Well, Nikki, thank you again for doing this. And it was uh, so great to meet no you. No problem. No problem whatsoever. It was wonderful to meet you as well. You too, Nikki. Thank you so much. Bye. No problem. Bye-bye.
Thanks for listening to the Badass Motherfucker Podcast. If you have a coworker who you believe is a badass motherfucker, head over to badassmotherfucker.com to nominate them. My goal is to highlight and share more stories of healthcare workers doing exceptional work in their community who deserve a little bit more recognition. If you enjoyed today's podcast, please give us a like, leave a review, and share it with your friends. Hell, slide into my DMs and tell me yourself. I can't wait to bring more stories your way. But until then, keep being the badass motherfucker that you are.